I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to continue our look at Daniel's prayer. We'll be looking at Daniel 9, 11 to 19, and I'm going to begin by reading this for us. So if you found your way to Daniel chapter 9, we're going to back up and read the entirety of his prayer beginning in verse 4. Daniel records, I prayed to Yahweh my God and I confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame, as it is to this day. To the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, and all the countries to which you have driven them, because of their unfaithful deeds with which they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Yahweh, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Nor have we obeyed the voice of Yahweh our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath, which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of Yahweh our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore Yahweh has kept the calamity in store, brought it on us, for Yahweh our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine upon your desolate sanctuary. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. This is truly a remarkable prayer. It is a prayer saturated with scripture. Daniel is appealing to texts. So we looked at those a couple of weeks ago. It's as though his entire life is filled with the word of God. And when he goes to the Lord in prayer, what comes out is those very truths rehearsed. In Daniel 9, of course, we are coming near to the end of the Babylonian exile. And Daniel's response to the end of that exile is not to plan what piece of land he'll buy or what house he'll build, but it is to pray. To pray fervently, even desperately to the Lord. And Daniel's prayer is that the nation would be soft-hearted toward God. Will she maintain a heart grip on her idolatry? Will it be the same old story? What good will it be to go back to the land and still be idolaters from the heart? This is Daniel the prophet's concern. And the heart of his prayer to God as the 70-year Babylonian captivity comes to a close. And we outlined Daniel's prayer this way, adoration, confession, and petition. 
It's a good pattern for prayer to begin by adoring the Lord, to rehearse to him his own greatness and his attributes, to stop and worship before we ask for things. And Daniel moves from adoration to confession. Surely a, an awareness of who God is brings to the fore how sinful we are. So Daniel confesses. And then Daniel lays before the Lord his petition. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at those first two portions. Adoration. Daniel acknowledged that God was great and God was good. And then we looked at the first part of Daniel's confession. His confession was simply, we are guilty. This evening, we'll begin by looking at the second part of Daniel's confession. He moves from affirming with God that we are guilty to affirming that God's judgment of the people is appropriate. It's appropriate. We pick that up in verse 11. Uh, Look down with me. Uh, Verses 11 to 14 are this second half of the confession. This judgment is appropriate. He begins in verse 11 by saying, Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice, so the curse has been poured out on us. Daniel is agreeing with God. That is what confession is, to speak with or to agree with God on these things. To confess, first of all, that we are guilty is to agree with God on his terms that our sin is heinous in his sight. And secondly, to agree with God that the consequences of our sin are appropriate. They're right in his sight. This is according to God's purpose. We summarize this part of Daniel's confession. He he simply says, it was our sin that brought us here. God, you are righteous in what you do, and you said this would happen. Let's read verses 11 to 14. Indeed, Daniel prays, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us this great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of Yahweh our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore Yahweh has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For Yahweh our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. To transgress in verse 11 is a familiar word in the Old Testament. It means to cross a line, to willfully move against, go against, to cross over a line that God has drawn. Israel has jumped over these lines again and again. And it says that They turned aside, and this turning aside in verse 11 completes the idea of transgression. Daniel is saying we transgressed God's law by turning aside. And these ideas are nearly equated grammatically. Daniel's point here is to say that turning aside from God's word is to transgress. Turning from God's law, Daniel says, uh, means that his people turned to a failure. Literally, you turned to a failure to listen to God's voice. To turn aside from God's word is itself sin. When a mom tells a toddler to clean up a mess and the child sets his feet and crosses his arms and turns his head to the side and says no and maybe even sticks his fingers in his ears so he can't hear mom talking anymore. He might be able to escape mom's demands if he has an inability to hear. And the problem with the toddler, of course, is he has already heard and now he is rejecting, subjecting himself to mom's voice again. This is intentional, culpable ignorance. It is a rebellious rejection of the truth. This is the way the prophet Hosea indicted the people. Listen to his words in Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You think, what's the problem? They just didn't know. How could they be held accountable? Hosea goes on and says, They lacked knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. And because you have rejected knowledge, I have rejected you, God says through Hosea. 
The problem with Israel's rejection of the truth and ignorance of the truth was that they had the truth and they turned aside from it. And this was the heart of their transgression. Israel has been exiled from the land because she has willfully rejected God's word, turning aside, and in turning aside from God's law, they became transgressors of it in greater and greater measure. They have known the truth, neglected the truth, rejected the truth, and transgressed the truth. And the tragedy is that obeying God's word, obeying his voice, would have brought prosperity and security in the land. And notice verse 11. So the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath. The curse and the oath go hand in hand. This is a a way of piling on the idea that the curses that God promised have come forward. These are the words that God himself said through his slave Moses. The curse and the oath are a reference to Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. We won't read all of those, but I'll give you two verses here from Deuteronomy 28. Moses said, Yahweh will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You shall become a horror, a proverb, and a taunt among all the people where the Lord drives you. What a tragic judgment it is when God gives a rebel exactly what the rebel wants. You want to reject the holy and living God and worship stuff made by hands? Okay, I'll give you that. And you'll be in exile to do those very things. These are the curses that God promised if his people disobeyed. And in Daniel's prayer, he said these curses have been poured out on us. This word for poured out is used of water in Exodus 9 and of molten metal in Ezekiel 22. Not drips or sprinkles of curse, but voluminous pouring out of this curse. And Daniel says, for we sinned against him. Very simple statement. This word for sin is the word for missing the mark. And it's interesting to notice in these penitential prayers in the Bible, Psalm 51, Psalm 32, Daniel 9, that you see the cornucopia of vocabulary of sin. Uh, There's not just one definition of sin that captures all that it is to go against God's word. To transgress is to cross the line. To sin is to miss the mark. Uh, There is the committing of iniquity and perversion and twisting of God's word. All those words are in here in this prayer. And Daniel's confession highlights Israel's heightened culpability. They had God's word. They turned aside from it. And what God's word said would happen did happen. Now they have no excuse. They are held to account. It's not kind for us to say to one another, see, I told you so. (laughs) That lacks some compassion. But this is the big prophetic, see, I told you so. And it was a gracious, compassionate, kind warning from God. Blessings if you obey me, you'll live in the land and prosper. And curses if you don't, and you'll be exiled. This is exactly what has come to pass, just as God's word had said. Look at verse 12. Thus God has confirmed his words. Literally, it is God has caused his words to stand. And these are the words, verse 12, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on this great calamity. The word for calamity is the same as the word for evil. It can mean a moral calamity or some disaster. And in the hands of God, this is God's good judgment bringing out a very bad time for Israel. A big bad, a disaster, a calamity. And the truth here is that God means what he says. Don't ever doubt God's coming judgment for unrepentant sin. This is as God promised. Listen to Jeremiah 35, 17. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing on Judah and on all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them. Because I spoke to them, but they did not listen. I have called them, but they did not answer. And you have this compounded grace of God in giving them a warning and a promise and then prophets coming and reminding of those very warnings and calling to the people to repent. 
And finally, God's judgment has come to the fore. And there are no surprises here. What's happening to the captives in Babylon is just what God said. And the rulers in verse 12 are doubly accountable here, not only for their own rejection of God's instruction, but also for leading the people into disaster. This is a weighty responsibility. And they have rebelled against God and led God's people to rebel against him. Notice the last half of verse 12. For under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. Is this hyperbole? Is this exaggeration? Is this some sort of rhetorical flourish in Daniel's account? I don't think it is. Certainly Israel was humiliated. Their sin brought about national shame. Their capital was vacant. Their holy place desolate. You can read about it in 2 Kings 25, 2 Chronicles 36. You, you can watch Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, write his lam- lamentations out as he sits on the hill outside of Jerusalem. And God foretold this disaster through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 5, verse 9. Because of all of your abominations, I will do among you what I have not done, and the like of which I will never do again. Therefore, fathers will eat their sons among you, and sons will eat their fathers. For I will execute judgments on you and scatter all your remnant to every wind. So as I live, declares Yahweh God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable idols and your abominations, therefore I also will withdraw, and my eye will have no pity, and I will not spare. One third of you will die by plague or be consumed by famine among you. One third will fall by the sword around you. One third I will scatter to every wind and I will unsheath a sword behind them. Certainly it would be a national humiliation to have your capital raided, plundered, besieged, overrun, and eventually burned to the ground and left in ruins. Could you imagine our own nation's capital? in ashes, unoccupied except perhaps by raccoons and foxes with trash blowing down Pennsylvania Avenue like tumbleweeds across a barren desert, with the memories of a once significant civilization fading like the pain on a thousand abandoned cars. What would that do to your psyche? What would that do to your own sense of well-being and security, your national pride? But many ancient cities had been demolished by enemy armies. Other cities experienced sieges that starved its populations to madness and cannibalism. Zedekiah wasn't the only ancient Near Eastern king to have his eyes plucked out or his children murdered. In what sense is Israel's situation unprecedented and unparalleled? Well, listen, no other people as Israel had such privilege. They had access to the living God. His holy dwelling place was in their midst. They were supposed to be a showcase to the nations of the uniqueness of Yahweh and their rich privilege of being his chosen people on the earth. And as Paul the Apostle would say, they had his very oracles. They had his word. Theirs was a stewardship of relationship to him and proclamation of his greatness. And as Ezekiel said, they piled up their idolatries everywhere, including in the temple, the very place where God's special presence was to dwell in Jerusalem. No other nation could have sinned like this. And so no other nation could have experienced such tragic calamity as this. It's one thing for a city to be raised to the ground. But under the whole heaven... No other city had God's special dwelling place decimated. The sacrificial system that God had provided for forgiveness of sin was stopped. The special meeting place of God with his people was in ruins, and the people were dead or scattered abroad into captivity. And God's promises were kept. 
You see, this destruction was exactly what God said he would do. And that is Daniel's point in this prayer. As part of his confession, he is agreeing with God that this judgment is appropriate. It is deserved. As awful as it is, it is in keeping with what God promised he would do. Look at verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of Yahweh our God. Notice what the nation did not do. Scholar Dale Ralph Davis has called this the great omission. It's a long list of things they did do. And here's this great one they did not do. They did not seek the favor of Yahweh. They didn't seek his favor. They they didn't turn to him. And listen, when you've offended somebody, does it make you want to avoid them? To, to turn away, find some other friends. And yet Yahweh, the one infinitely offended, wants to welcome sinners, to come to him, to turn to him, to find forgiveness. And so this compounded rebellion is that they did not seek his favor. You mean Yahweh has favor for the people that set up idols in his temple? Yes, if you would but turn. Double tragedy. And what an amazing statement this is from Daniel. A relationship to God apparently is not a one and done. You only get one shot, one strike and you're out. Yahweh was seekable by sinners. He was ready to forgive. Read the kingly reign of Manasseh. Manasseh's reign was so bad that it demanded the exile to be inevitable. It it demanded the exile would come, and yet Manasseh is said to have turned to the Lord and sought his favor at the end of his life. Amazing. The worst of the worst can find favor with Yahweh if they will but turn. And the turning here is a turning from iniquity and giving attention to his truth. Do you see that in verse 13? We have not sought the favor of Yahweh our God by turning from iniquity and by turning to or giving attention to your truth. Again, this is an amazing statement. Yahweh was ready to bless transgressors. If they would have repented, God would have relented. In fact, he did just that numerous times when a pretty good king would turn, a Hezekiah or a Josiah. They turned their hearts to the Lord and and led temporary, short-lived national repentances and stayed off this judgment. It's also remarkable in that the one offended could be even approached by an offender. Uh, The the God, the one who is so infinitely grieved by our sin, makes a way for sinners to even come near and ask for mercy. God's patience with sinners, his love for the unworthy, his persistent, gracious appeal to the recalcitrant. He is not like us. If you were like us, we would all be toast. Sometime the book of Hosea needs to be preached. The theme of there, of course, is God's relentless love for the unlovely, the unworthy. God initiates and he seeks. And and, and we're thinking about unfaithful Israel and all of her idolatries, her adulteries, her unfaithfulness to Yahweh. And you think, well, would would a husband even have her back? And God relents when sinners turn. Turn from your sin and turn to the one you've offended and he will help. That's Daniel's plea. To seek the favor here in verse 13, it's a Hebrew idiom, to soothe the face or even to sweeten the face. It's the same word used by Moses in his intercessory prayer in Exodus 32. 
Another remarkable implication of this statement is that a failure to ask God, a failure to ask God for help, a failure to ask God to help you out of your sin is itself sin. They did not entreat the Lord. And this too is disobedience. This is rebellion compounded, a double offense against God. God is the one who has been wronged. He graciously offers to make it right. And what does it say about a heart that refuses help from the only one who could help? What does it say about a heart who refuses peace from the only one who can offer peace? What does it say about a heart who refuses life from the author of life? Such a heart would rather die with a white knuckle grip on sin than to let it go and be healed. I want to keep on sitting in my asbestos sofa, drinking my arsenic latte, smoking my chlorine cigarettes, and lounging with the rotting corpses of my disease-ridden friends because I want to do life my way. That is the insanity of of recalcitrant sin. I don't want to turn. I don't want to have life. I don't want to be healed. I don't want to be forgiven. Israel's attitude was, you can have my idolatries when you pry them from my cold dead fingers. They're like the unrepentant earth dwellers during the great tribulation to come. Revelation 9 records their thoughts. In those days men will seek death and they will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. They will acknowledge in that time that the wrath of the Lamb has come, and who can withstand it? They will hide themselves under the rocks and in the caves, and they will not repent. Revelation 9.20 The rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their immoralities, nor their thefts. The end is near. They know it's near. They know it's God's wrath that's being poured out on a worldwide cosmic judgment during that time, and they refuse to repent. What a tragic spot for a human heart to be in. Look at God's righteous response in verse 14. Therefore, Yahweh has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. God is said here to keep vigilant, careful watch. The Hebrew says he watched over the calamity. He is overseeing the calamity to bring it to its right end, to hold it secure in its place in reserve for the right time for its implementation. God has secured this calamity and God has brought it about. Israel's plight was not the accidental circumstances of geopolitical movements. It was the careful, intentional fulfillment of God's threats against their disobedience. Daniel affirms Yahweh is righteous in all his doings, in all he has done. Look at verse 14 in the second half. Yahweh our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done. Literally, his doings which he does. But we have not obeyed him. This is the heart of a repentant prophet. God is right. Any consequence, any judgment, any discipline, any correction from him is in keeping with his righteousness and the right ways he does things and how we fall so far short of God's standard in these things. Daniel is concerned here to uphold Yahweh's reputation. Israel is not getting more punishment than she deserves. Actually, she's getting far less. Notice how Daniel closes out this confession. We have not obeyed his voice. There's no one to blame but ourselves. This is an echo of the song of Moses from Deuteronomy 32. Moses saying, The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. They have acted corruptly toward him. They are not his children because of their defect. They are perverse and a crooked generation. God is righteous. 
God's character is not in question in Israel's exile. This has all been according to his word. And I want you to notice in the span of these four verses, ten times this point is made. All of this according to your word. In verse 11, transgressed your law, turned aside to ignore your voice. The curse and the oath are your words, written in the law of Moses, your slave. Verse 12, God caused his word to stand. This great disaster was promised by his word. This is what he spoke. Verse 13, written in his law. To repent would be to give attention to his truth. And in verse 14, we did not listen to his voice. In addition to the ten times in these four verses that God's words are mentioned specifically, Daniel's language in this confession is a compendium of scripture passages that Daniel has turned to prayer from Joshua, from 1 Kings, from 2 Chronicles. And in verse 15, we move from confession to petition. Although we'll see, even as Daniel picks up the asking God for things section of this prayer, he continues to interject confessions, outbursts of, we sinned. Look at this petition beginning in verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as it is this day, we've sinned. We've been wicked. There's that interjection before he even gets to the request. This petition begins with an appeal to God's mighty work of redemption in Israel's past. The Exodus. The Exodus out of slavery in Egypt. It was the monument of God's power in the Old Testament to his rescuing his people. It was the prototype of rescue. With a strong arm, God displayed his power, defeated the enemies, and took his people out of slavery. In the wilderness, he entered into gracious covenant agreement with them, reaffirmed his commitment to be their God and to make them his people. He made provision for them to dwell in the land. He made provision for himself to dwell in their midst, to protect them from enemies, to provide good for them and to cause them to prosper. And in doing all of these things, God would make his own name great among the nations. Israel would be famous because they were Yahweh's people. And Yahweh is the one who rescued them with a strong arm out of Egypt and brought them through the Red Sea and destroyed Pharaoh's armies. God's reputation went before the people amongst the nations. Yahweh is the creator of all things and the God of all peoples everywhere. And he would be Israel's husband and shepherd and king and keeper and rock and warrior. The Exodus was God's mighty deliverance of his people joined to his entering into covenant favor with them. Powerful redemption and his gracious presence. And all of this would bring about God's renown. He would be known for his great and mighty acts on behalf of his people. The appeal of Daniel in highlighting this history is to say something like, God, you made a name for yourself before, by rescuing your people from calamity and by entering into gracious relationship with them. Would you do that again? Daniel interjects here at the end of verse 15 again. We have sinned. We've been wicked. It's as if fresh awareness of grace elicits another outburst of confession. Hasn't Daniel confessed enough already? And we find that a repentant heart produces the self-loathing that Ezekiel describes. Ezekiel 36, 31, you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. This is what the Puritans have labeled a holy heartbrokenness. This holy heartbrokenness, this self-loathing, this fresh awareness of grace that prompts me to say again, oh, my sin. It's not at odds with grace. It's not at odds with joy. It's not at odds with blessing from God. It is the heartbroken heartbeat of a repentant prophet on behalf of a people who need to feel this heartbrokenness. Look at verse 16. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away. The petition is this, God, 
cease. O oh God, turn your anger away. It begins with an O oh, please in Hebrew. It's very emphatic. And notice Daniel's heart here. He knows that God's anger has been just, and he's turning to this same God to ask him to relent for the wrath to turn to gracious favor. And he appeals on the basis of God's righteousness. Did you notice that in verse 16? O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away. Does that make sense? How could God be righteous and forgive the unrighteous? This, frankly, is the problem of all human religion. And it is essentially the problem of the Bible How could God not let any sin go? How could God be just and good and holy and righteous and forgive? To let the wicked go and to punish the innocent, God calls an abomination. Proverbs 17. And yet, To the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, that one's faith is credited as righteousness. This fundamental problem of the Bible that God will by no means acquit the guilty is only satisfied in that God himself would come in the flesh in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And be an innocent substitute on behalf of the guilty. So that as Paul says in Romans 3, God could be just or righteous. And the justifier or the righteousifier, same words in both places, of those who believe. How can God be righteous and forgive? How can his forgiveness be in accord with his righteous acts? Only by substitution. Only by an innocent sacrifice provided by God in the place of sinner to which the sinner looks in faith and receives gracious pardon. There's another sense in which God is righteous to forgive and it is that he keeps his promise. He limited this particular judgment to 70 years. And he promised in Leviticus 26 the following, If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity, Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember also my covenant with Isaac and with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. For the land will be abandoned by them and will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They meanwhile will be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinance and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. For I am Yahweh their God, but I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am Yahweh. And God is righteous in keeping his promise to relent on the judgment. And you can hear Daniel's heart reflecting on Leviticus 26 and this very promise as he is confessing his own sins and the sins of his fathers. Just as Leviticus said the nation should do. And God would turn. This is a remarkable statement that if they turn from their sin, God would remember the covenant, remember the fathers, and remember the land. Turn to Exodus chapter 32. We have a similar circumstance here of intercessory prayer. And I mentioned before that the same word for entreating the Lord is used here. This is, of course, after the golden calf rebellion. The idolatrous, raucous party in celebratory rebellion against Yahweh replacing him 
with statues made from your jewelry. God says in verse 10, Let me alone, Moses, that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation, Moses. What would you do? (laughs) Yeah, the land of Moses. I'll be a great nation. The 12 tribes of Moses. This is sounding pretty good. It was not Moses' response. Verse 11, Then Moses entreated Yahweh his God, And he said, O Yahweh, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? You hear a similar appeal as Daniel's. Why should the Egyptians speak, saying with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountain and to destroy them from the face of the earth, to turn from your burning anger, or turn from your burning anger, and change your mind about doing harm to your people? What a remarkable statement. Moses is appealing to God's great history of rescuing his people, making a name for himself among the nations. Moses is interested in God's glory, God's own reputation, and God's integrity with his promises. He says, verse 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your promise to whom you, or your servants to whom you swore by yourself. You said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heavens, And all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they will inherit it forever. So Yahweh changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. All the same appeals here. God's reputation, God's renown among the nations, God's glory, God's promises to the fathers and the land. And we get this really interesting statement that God changed his mind we think wait a second god doesn't change no shadow of turning in thee i sang that psalm 40 or uh, hymn 43 in the hymnal great is thy faithfulness what about the immutability of god how can god be said to change his mind it's important to understand what's happening here in exodus 32 is that god is changing his mind from what he threatened to what he promised think about this if moses says yeah make a great nation of me Moses was not of the tribe of Judah. What happens to the promise? Genesis 3.15 and a seed that would come filtered down through Genesis 50 and the promise coming through Judah, the lion's whelp that shall hold the scepter. If God wipes out the nation of Israel and makes a new nation out of Moses, he undoes the foundational promises of the Bible that are provision for our own forgiveness of sin. And listen, God has had a plan to redeem sinners from the foundation of the world. God is not changing his mind in terms of his purposes, his plans, his character, his attributes. He has actually brought a human instrument in to be a mediator, an instrument of intercessory prayer to appeal to the very unchangeable purposes and plans and promises and character and attributes of God to do what God promised he would do. But the change is not from God's plan A to plan B. The, God is a, the, the change is a change of disposition in what God had threatened and what would be righteous judgment and an appeal to God's mercy to fulfill God's own promises. In other words, God has not changed. But God has seen fit to bring in a human instrument as the means of God keeping his promises in intercessory prayer. You think Daniel is thinking about Exodus 32 as he's praying very similar words, very similar thoughts. God, keep your promises. You made promises to the fathers. You made promises about the land. We have sinned. It is right for God to keep his promises. And then to satisfy the demands of his own justice himself through the sacrificial system, through innocent blood, pointing to Christ, ultimately by Christ himself. Listen to this appeal in Daniel uh, 9.16. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, from your holy mountain, 
This is remarkable. Da- Daniel wants the anger to turn away from whom? From what? From the city Jerusalem, from the holy mountain where the temple stood, the temple complex. Why? Because they had become a reproach. And your people have become a reproach. The nations see our sorry state and we belong to you. Jerusalem belongs to you. It's called by your name. It's near and dear to you, ordained by you. It reflects your heart to be near to your people and to dwell among them. And now it sits in ruins. And remember the theological battle that is tracing all through the book of Daniel. Daniel has outlined this for us so far. The the pagan nations saw their gods as regional deities, fighting other regional deities in the wars of one nation against another. Only Israel served the living God, the only true God. And Daniel longs for God's name and his honor to be vindicated in the sight of the nations. He doesn't want the nations to say, well, Bel and Marduk, they were more powerful than Israel's God, Yahweh. Daniel is very much concerned about God's reputation. Listen to verse 17. He says, So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Cause your face to shine reflects the ironic blessing of Numbers chapter 6. And Daniel's petition here from verse 17 forward is loaded with scripture, saturated with references from Isaiah, the Psalms, Jeremiah, 1 Kings, Deuteronomy, and possibly Lamentations. He's praying God's own words back to him. This request to cause your face to shine is a request for God's gracious favor, for undeserved help and kindness. Daniel is saying, if God were to look on us with favor, all would be well. And notice what he asks for in terms of favor, the object of God's favor in verse 17, his own sanctuary. Cause your face to shine on your desolate sanctuary. God, would your favor be bestowed on that place where people would meet with you again? Daniel's petition is that God's honor would be vindicated, his presence would return amongst his chosen people. He's praying, may the world know that you are the true God and and would you be with us again? And look at verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see. Incline your ears. Bend your ear. That is to stoop down and, and, and pay attention. Open your eyes and see our desolations. The city is desolate. The temple is desolate. And we ourselves are desolations. The people themselves are like the desolated city. Broken down, humiliated, in disarray, in need of repair. In need of rebuilding, in need of renewal. Again, what good would be the end of captivity if the people of Israel just go back into the land, have some property, and are idolaters from the heart? Notice the second half of verse 18. We are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. It's like Titus 3, 5, or Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Not of any works that we could do, but of your grace. There's nothing in us A sinner's only possible appeal would be on the basis of God's mercy. Any sinner asking for what he is due or what he deserves will only receive retribution for sin. But a sinner appealing to God on the basis of his mercy and compassion will find forgiveness and an infinite treasure trove of undeserved blessing. Leon Morris said, all prayer is on the basis of mercy. Verse 19 Uh, resounds with staccato appeals, a crescendo of fervent, humble, believing prayer. Daniel says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. And he closes it out by saying, For your own sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel is appealing to God's affections for his people and his promises. And all of this for the Lord's glory, as Ephesians 1, 6 says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Daniel's heartbeat in this prayer is for the Lord's honor, on the Lord's merit, according to the Lord's righteous doings, for the publishing of his righteous reputation among the nations. This is good prayer. Looking back over Daniel's prayer request here in verses 15 and 19, I want you to notice the pronouns used. 
Contrast the word your, referring to God, with the words we and us, referring to Daniel and the people of Israel. And I want you to notice what God brings to the table and what we bring to the table when these two parties come together for some arrangement. What do we sinners have to offer God? And what does a righteous but compassionate God have to offer us? Here's what God has, starting in verse 15. Your people, your name, your anger, your wrath, your righteousness, your city, your holy mountain, your people, your slave, your face, your sanctuary, your ear, your eyes, the city called by your name, your face, your great mercy, your sake, your name, your city, your people. And starting in verse 15, we sinned, we acted wickedly, our sins, our father's iniquities, our desolation, our supplication, and interestingly, not our righteousness. And in verses 15 and 17, the phrase, our God, is used. Daniel knows there's nowhere else to turn but our God, the God of Israel, the one true God, the God who said, I will be your God and you will be my people. This is the God to whom Daniel turns in this prayer. The refrain is that Yahweh is our God and we have nothing to bargain with but our sin and his compassion. And God chooses to make his name great by having compassion and extending grace to undeserving sinners who will but turn to him in faith and repentance. What a lesson this prayer is for us. A model an example. In a heartbeat, not just as we take our own adoration, confession, and petitions before the Lord, but perhaps even as we pray for the nation of Israel, to whom God will still keep his covenant promises and who are en masse in rebellion to this day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words of your slave, Daniel the prophet, as he prays, confessing his own sins and the sins of the people. We pray to have a heart like his, eager to honor you, longing for your reputation to be vindicated, and pleading on the basis of your mercy, your compassion, your kindness, your covenant love. God, we have nothing to offer you as sinners but our own sin. Anything good in us comes from you. We pray, too, for the peace of Israel, the kind of peace that only comes through forgiveness of sin and a cessation of hostilities through repentance and faith. God, we pray that we as a church of Jew and Gentile together in one body would revel in your grace, not despising the natural branches, but longing for you to fulfill all of your promises. We thank you for the humility that your grace brings. And we thank you that you love sinners and pick us up, lift up our heads by your love. We pray these things in the name of your Son, who bled so that we could. Amen.